So it's good to be home to where I started my career. I spent a little over a decade teaching science at Thomas Worthington. And uh, I now have the pleasure of working with a group of scientists at Ohio State that work all over the world to try to understand our, our climate system and polar regions. And, um, and it's an exciting place to work because I get to be a mesh within the scientific community. And I also get to see what a lot of dis different disciplines in the sciences do day to day. So I wanted to start out with this quote by Carl Sagan from a few decades ago that I think, unfortunately, is still very relevant today. About three years ago, my wife and I purchased a, a very old house in the city. And uh, as anybody knows, when you purchase a house, you sign a lot of documents. And one of the documents you go ahead and you sign deals with lead paint and the lead paint that's around many houses in the US. And uh, we signed those documents. We both renovated houses, didn't think much about it. During that renovation, there's a number of precautions we took. But there was a lot of lead paint chips that were throughout the house. There was a lot of lead paint dust generated. And um, shortly after we moved in, my daughter was born. And during the course of her one-year checkup, we came to find out that she had an elevated lead level, something that we didn't expect. And we were very surprised because we thought we had taken the right precautions, which took me to re-examine some of the work that I had done and some of the challenges that we were going to face with her health and some of the, the challenges I faced trying to communicate scientific information at Ohio State every day. In democracy and capitalism, there's two boxes that are critically important to making decisions. And one of those is the ballot box, and where we vote for individuals and initiatives. The second is where we make decisions every day, and that's the cash box, places we spend our dollars. And we make those decisions. We need accurate information to make those decisions. And there's a number of vehicles we have to, to help us make informed decisions. Uh, one of those is investigative journalism that should give us information about how our public discourse is operating, things that are happening in science, business, government, the public arena. And the second is science, how we go to better understand our natural world, and hopefully use that information to make informed decisions about what we're doing day to day. I'd like to speak a bit about science today and how science operates. For many people, you don't realize how much science is impacting your everyday life. And I think there's an appreciation now for the devices we have in our pockets and, and how those would have been considered supercomputers three decades ago. Um, but we also interact with science on a lot of superficial levels every day, and we don't understand the complexity happening below the surface. And one of those is our, our weather forecast. Most people, when you look at a weather forecast on the newspaper, TV, or radio, will think that that forecast is coming from the agency where you're watching it, the news, the newspaper, or the online feed. But really, they're just re-imaging and making data accessible that was created by a government agency and a much bigger scientific community. And that much bigger scientific community is the National Weather Service. So every day, there are weather balloons deployed throughout the US. We have very complex satellites that collect data. There's a research community that's going ahead and improving the modeling techniques that we have available. And the National Weather Service and NOAA provide us with a forecast that then our news media goes ahead and provides in a format that's easier for us to understand. But there's a lot of science below the surface that we don't maybe appreciate how those tax dollars are put to work. If you ask the average student and you ask them to draw a picture of a scientist, typically the picture you'll get is a disheveled person in a lab coat, maybe some beakers in the background, typically a white male. And this is just quite a bit of research in this arena. If you probe and prod a bit more, maybe ask young adults or adults, they'll say it's a collection of facts, textbooks, things that they learned in school. They may even could point to the textbook they used. And if you poke and prod a bit more, you'll get answers as though it's, it's crazy apparatus, it's an experiment, an explosion, something happening with flames. And if you keep prodding, you'll typically get a reference to the scientific method, chapter one of most high school ninth grade textbooks. You know, a method that most scientists that work in the arena would argue nobody follows verbatim. Some people test hypotheses. Many people I work with don't. Everybody does something in this process, and there's a philosophical underpinning, but nobody actually follows this step, this process lockstep. This is a more accurate portrayal of the science I deal with every day. It's largely based on communication. We have to get together as a team, write a proposal, find funding. That funding has to be used to fund the science and pay for the work that's being done. We have to get together in meetings and figure out how to approach an experiment, how to collect data, how to share information. What do the conclusions mean? Are there any assumptions we haven't thought about? You create posters and se seminar talks. You share that information more. You write manuscripts. You publish. But also, there's data this all has to be based on. And that data is collected for us in the field and also in the laboratory. Now, this process is quite old. And most, most people don't realize how, how long the scientific process has been around, the formal process we follow today. Uh, it was natural philosophy. It largely stems from Sir Francis Bacon in the 15 and 1600s, who, who said that we couldn't just base 
our scientific conclusions on philosophy. We had to have observable facts. We had to use our five senses. And those five senses had to inform what we were doing. We had to be able to refute the information we were coming up with. We had to be able to share it out. And at the same time, the Royal Society in England was created for people doing research to share out their results with the community and with themselves, to push themselves ahead, to publish their results. Now realize, these people were largely aristocrats, or people that were able to find favor with wealthy individuals or royalty. But it set the stage for the scientific community we see currently. And then we saw some advancements in our own country. And one that surprises most people is the development of the National Academies of Science, which is still present in the US today. The National Academies was started by Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln was challenged with a difficult scientific um, problem, which is to develop a magnet, a compass, to work in an iron-sided ship, a place that would normally interfere with the compass that was developed. And they were having problems. They couldn't find a company or individual to develop this device. So he went to the scientific community. He created an all-volunteer group that would elect the next generation of researchers. But the intent was to make sure that nobody was biased. Was, nobody was there to get money off the system. They were there to develop the best understanding with the current science we had. And the National Academy still exists today. And any time the US government has a challenging problem that we can't find an answer to, we turn to the National Academies to distill down the best science that's out there. Following World War II, we saw the opening of science in the US. There had been so much that had been done preceding World War II and so much investment in science that the US had had. They decided they needed to open up funding for researchers that were outside the typical methods. Most research, as I mentioned, had been funded by wealthy aristocrats, royalty, philanthropists. At this point, the US government invested a lot more money. And we saw research centers like myself, the current one I work at at Ohio State, able to go ahead and have their own projects and research initiatives. But still, we have this misconception every day that science is this linear progress, a process. If we look in a, a textbook, we'll see this timeline, the advancement of science. A few things to consider. The process we see has false starts, has dead ends. Sometimes disciplines fold back in on themselves. The process never ends. So the, the timeline that we see shows an ending, but it never reaches an end. We keep advancing our knowledge. Even with that advancement of knowledge, we have to make decisions with the best information we have today. Be it best, it's the best we have, even if it's not final. Now, I'd be remiss to say that science is imperfect. We have seen charlatans. We have seen individuals publish information that was fraudulent. The data was shown to be invalidated, such as the idea that uh, vaccines would contribute to autism. We've had individuals steal scientific data to discern the structure of DNA, egos coming in the way of scientific work, and ends justifying the means. Nonetheless, science is a human process. And we eventually get to truth. Fraudulent data, bad information is eventually found out. And as I've worked at our center, I've learned the complexity of information, the role that science has had in our policymaking arena. I'll start out with lead paint, because lead paint's what's most affected my family recently. And as we started to try to figure out, was it lead paint dust? Was it toys that were painted with lead paint that were brought in over from overseas? Was it lead pipes that were leading into our houses? We found out that there's actually a very complex history to lead that's well understood, and that a lot of decisions in science hadn't been taken into account. Our first understanding of lead and lead paints is from the 18 and 1900s, early 1900s. And that information in European countries led to the banning of lead paint, whitening agents that were lead-based in most paints by the 1920s. Now, my house was built in 1908. So it's very likely if these had also been banned in the US, my house would have never been painted white, the insides, the, the wood trim, and we would have no paint, lead paint issue. But come to find out in our own country, we didn't decide to adopt a ban until the early 70s, and that ban didn't go into effect until the late 70s, dramatically affecting my family's life. Also realizing that in Columbus, there are many houses and many large cities throughout the US that have a similar problem. Well, what about CFCs? Growing up as a, a child, I remember seeing this in my textbooks all the time. There was information about statues that were being dis discolored or disintegrating in large cities. We saw a lot of places out in the eastern US that had contaminated watersheds. We knew about CFCs in the 70s, and the scientific consensus was pretty clear. And we had adopted a public policy to deal with this by the late 80s. Now, it's kind of fallen out of vogue today. We don't hear too much about it. That hole hasn't disappeared. It's still there. And it will eventually close. We had a success story led by the United States. Um, acid rain, another example. In this case, there was data that came in from the early 60s. And by the 19, 1995, we had a cap and trade system that allowed us to go ahead and deal with the, the acid rain situation. Smoking, something that uh, 
a lot of consensus had been reached. And by early 60s, the Surgeon General had created a document that summarized all of our findings about cigarette smoke, the contribution to things like lung cancer. And by 1998, there was a settlement. But in that settlement, we found something out about the process that a lot of industries and vested interests had used in the US to try to debunk the science. We found out there was a very clear understanding of the contribution between smoking and lung cancer and other health issues. But that information was buried. There was an active vehicle of communication that had been used to try to make the science unclear, to attack the scientific research done in the universities around the US, and in some cases, to attack individuals. Which takes us to the place that I operate day to day, climate change. Still a very contentious issue in the United States, but unique to the United States in that no other country is currently having the same discussion we are. Now, I could show lots and lots and lots of information on this, but the, the, the summary is to look at the past and say, our scientific understanding of climate change is quite clear and quite old. As early as the 1700s, we had an understanding of the greenhouse effect. We understood and started to calculate how much the warming could be. We started to go ahead and monitor CO2 and how much CO2 there was in the atmosphere. And that consensus had become, become clear enough that by the 1980s, the modeling community and the atmospheric sciences started to understand what we expected the warming to be and started publishing papers on this. Currently, many of the people that led those initiatives have since passed away. The science is so old. This is almost three decades ago that we've had consensus on climate change. Additional information came from other disciplines by the 90s. In the early 90s, we saw the Kyoto Protocol go into place. Unfortunately, this initial international effort had some countries, including the United States, not sign up. And so those mandatory effects never took place, which led us to last December, actually December 1996, when we had the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement was designed to be a step, voluntary step in the right direction. In the arena where I sit, there are questions of whether this will get us to where we want to be. And we, as all countries, have agreed to have warming no greater than 2 degrees Celsius. It will be difficult to reach that target. So I'd like to show you a, an image of what changes we've seen on the Earth already. One thing we can look at is temperature changes. And in the observable period since the 1880s, we've seen a change in the planet. You'll see this become most pronounced in the 1960s. Areas that are orange are warmer than average. Areas that are blue are colder than average. You see a dramatic impact, especially in the Arctic. And this is just one measure of the changes we've already experienced, changes that the scientific community has a very strong sense of. I could show you other pictures of ice. I could show you changes in precipitation patterns, coral bleaching you could read about in the paper this week. But that's just one example, which leads us to look below the surface. If that's what our temperature says we are, What's the checkup? What other information if we start to poke and prod below the surface? And the teams where I work look at ice. And as you look at that ice back 800,000 years, we've seen that temperature and CO2 levels follow very closely in tandem with one another. If we look at to where we are today, right now we're at 400 parts per million. We've never been at that level in the last 3 million years. It's a very different system we're entering than we used to be. But as a good doctor, you also want to ask, what is the prognosis of your, of your patient? Where are you headed? And that prognosis, at this point, looks somewhat tenuous. We could be heading into a realm of 900 to 1,100 parts per million, which is very difficult for the atmospheric sciences community to understand what that would look like and how dramatically different our system would be with that many, much CO2 in the atmosphere. So a much different system. How should we respond? What should we as individuals, agencies, communities do? So I go back to the two different boxes that dictate things in democracy and capitalism, places we make decisions on what we should do. We all have to look out for our children. And with climate change, it's not so much looking out for ourselves as the next generation, because inevitably, our youth will end up inheriting the problems we create. These are problems that don't go back in the box. CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for centuries to millennia. So there's no way to superfund site your way out of this. The problem will be there. It'll be very difficult to deal with. There's also inertia in the system. It takes 30 years for the warming to be fully felt. So we are feeling the last effects of emissions from the 1980s. So what will my daughter inherit? What does the world look like for her? We also have to realize there are a lot of people in the world that are much more vulnerable. People that live in the United States and elsewhere, working in Mumbai, that some of them that live at sea level, or that live in inland areas whose water table is being brought down. Each of them hope for a bright future for their children. Each of them aren't a statistic on a table or a number on a graph, but they all want bright futures. And those bright futures are put in peril by decisions many of us are making halfway around the world. So I wanted to close with a quote, a quote by Isaac Asimov, um, a quote that's by somebody who's a biochemist, 
He happened to be a very famous science fiction writer. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. And my hope is by sharing this information that many people in this room can take action in order to relegate this quote to the dustbin of history. Thank you.